Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping reminders. All audience members are muted with camera off upon entry. Please use the Q&A box to post your questions and we will answer them at the end. We respect res um, expect respectful and productive discussions and have zero tolerance for harassment or discrimination of any kind. The session is 50 minutes long and we have three lovely panelists. They will uh, present in order of my introductions. First, we have Caroline Bennett, who is the founder and director of Soul of Discretion. She is based in the UK. Then we have Jennifer Ahern, Pro Program Director of Future of Fish, based in Peru. Last but not least, we have Ryan O'Riordan, if I butchered that, I'm so sorry, Deputy Director of Low Impact Fishers of Europe, otherwise known as Life EU, and he is based in Belgium. So thank you all for being here. I will start with Caroline, the floor is yours. Lovely, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to try and screen share. Just the word for everybody yet. Um, so, soul of discretion. Uh, I'll just give you a brief introduction to that. We're a community interest company, which is a bit like a social enterprise. Um, we're based in Plymouth, in the south of the UK. We work exclusively with the under 10 meter boats. So those are defined as the small scale artisanal sector in the UK. Um, the fishers are part of the co-op, so they, they, the fishers uh, that land own part of the, the, the community interest company. Um, aside from exclusively using these under 10 metre boats, we do full traceability on all our fish. And this is an example of our label. So we'll put with the fish there, you'll see the, the species name. And we also put the Latin name, which of course sounds obvious, but because there are so many um, curious names, even within the, the, the southwest of England, we'll call one species different, a, a different number of things. So just to be really clear, we always put the Latin name in there as well. And then we put the boat with the method of catch. So it might be trawled off um, the Emma Louise or line caught off the happy days. Um, so we'll put the name of the boat, the fisher and the method of catch. Um, and you can see, and I'll touch on this a bit later, but you can see on the bottom left here, the Soil Association logo, which is a bit of a misnomer in that it's called Soil Association rather than anything to do with the sea. Um, but they are the biggest organic certifier of meat and vegetables in the UK. And I'm trying to inspire them to get a similar um, sits, I mean, certify, I'm, I'm, I'm wary to use the word certification because it's such a loaded one, um, but a means of differentiating small from large scale. So that's us. And why I set it, I set up solar discretion about six, seven years ago now, 2016. Um, and my background was in sushi restaurants. And it was very difficult once you understood that there were problems in the ocean, it was very difficult trying to source low impact fish. So fish that weren't damaging the environment. And I think with all of this talk about environmentally sensitive fishing and farming, people still have to eat. So I think you have to be prepared to be part of the solution. And even if it's not a perfect one, it's on a trajectory to a better, uh, a better path. Um, and there are sort of a number of reasons why I wanted to em enforce to our customers the difference between industrial scale and small scale, as opposed to the rhetoric at the moment where they're saying, oh, we're told that we can't eat cod and we should eat mackerel. And for me, that just wasn't enough. It's like, well, is it cod caught in an industrial trawl with modern day slaves skipping the boat? Or is it caught from a small man on his boat off the south coast? Um, whose money is spent locally in the local economy. And for me, the do eat this species and don't eat that species is not working with nature. Nature is an ecosystem that requires a very balanced approach to it. So it was more a question of how and who caught that fish rather than which fish is it that you're choosing to eat. And I alighted on this wonderful one pager 
by Daniel Pauly, who is uh, a leading marine biologist from British Columbia University. And he put everything that we've been trying and failing in the most part to articulate in this one brilliant page. Um, and it's taken from global statistics around the world. Uh, it compares large scale to small scale. So this isn't UK specific, but I imagine Brian and Jennifer will say, yeah, what you can see here is pretty similar to what happens anywhere on the planet. So small scale fishers around the globe are faced with similar issues. So the first point there is the annual landings for human consumption by the industrial scale globally is 60 million tons. I'm hoping you can see this on the screen. I, I don't know how big it is, but there you go. 60 million tons globally. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, and then the small scale sector lands about 27 million tons. That's not far off half. And I am so often inundated with these, oh, Caroline, you and your hippy dippy ideas that you can serve the, the demand for fish with your small scale fisheries. They simply don't catch enough. It's like Daniel Pauly presents this fantastic statistics that shows actually they produce an awful lot of fish especially if we, we adjusted that for um, developing world. Um, the second line there is the annual catch that's discarded at, ski, at sea. And of course, the EU have done a lot to try and prevent this, but the legislation came in, when was it, Brian, four or five years ago, but it's largely ignored in the UK because there simply isn't any monitoring of it. But 10 million tonnes is estimated, and it can only ever be estimated to be discarded at sea. Um, from the industrial scale, whereas the small scale discard virtually nothing. Um, third line there is the annual catch for industrial reduction to either fish meal or fish oil. Of the large scale, about 26 million tons, so nearly, nearly half of what they land is, is um, reproduced into fish meal for farmed fish, which then goes to support uh an increasingly affluent developed world at the expense often on places like mauritania or indonesia or chile where they're taking the small scale bottom feeding fish to turn those into fish meal when they were producing perfectly adequately good sources of protein for local people so there's a social injustice there that is so massive that i think is completely lost on the, on the Western public when they're eating fish. Um, and you can see there, the small scale, the small scale uh, sector produces virtually nothing for industrial meal. But if you then look at the, what the amount that was landed, 27 million for the small scale, 60 for the large scale, you deduct the discards and you deduct the fish meal proceeds. Actually, who knew, who knew small scale fisheries provide more fish for human consumption than the industrial scale. So, so no to the big scale bodies. Um, then you go down to the fourth line there, the fuel used per, per kilo of, of cons consumed fish. In the large scale, it's five to 20 tons. And in the small scale, it's a, a much less figure, but still nonetheless massive. And I just thought about this. You can imagine uh, a two liter mug of Starbucks coffee being needed to produce just a kilo of fish is just an extraordinary amount of fuel. It really is, even on a good scale, it's phenomenal. Um, and this stat came out some years ago, but I think now, of course, with the problems, particularly in Europe, of, of consumption of oil and the need to re reduce our, our reliance upon it, this figure has to be part of the, the um, argument towards differentiation of small over industrial. It's becoming increasingly more important. And then looking on the second to last line there, the number of fishers employed. So about half a million in the industrial, but the small scale are really on hand workers. They require many more people to get involved. So the local communities benefit far more from the coastal vibrance of these small scale guys than the industrial. And there is a lot of work now being done in the UK on modern day slavery, um, where boats that land into what we perceive as fluffy, lovely local ports such as Brixham and not so much Plymouth, but they land into local ports and they're sold as local fish. 
but their, their crew are from Ghana, Ghana or Sri Lanka or Indonesia, very good crew, but they're not legally allowed to, allow, legally allowed to land in the, the UK and they are paid a fraction of the minimum wage that's allowable in the UK. So of course they then contribute to this low cost food that is driving this industrial scale fishery um, which on every level is both damaging for the planet, damaging and damaging for people's societal benefits. Um, so another reason to support small scale. And the last one then is the subsidies, the industrial scale needs these ridiculous amounts of subsidies from taxpayers in the EU. Um, and I, I saw in the last couple of years during shutdown here that in Brixham, one of the most dominating, they have 80% of the quota, so 80% of the, uh, of the access rights around um, the Brixham boats is owned by just one company. And they benefited from a two million pound investment um, to, 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 to sort of improve fish key landing facilities and that kind of thing from the EU taxpayers in during lockdown. And you think, why is it that the, 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 the taxpayer is subsidizing damaging fisheries that employ modern day slaves to, to run their, their fuel dependent ships? None of it adds up. So small scale fishing really is the answer. Um, and that's essentially why we started up Solar Discretion to be able to offer the ethical, conscious consumer an alternative and to be able to say, okay, I don't want to eat animal protein often, but when I do, I want it to have as low an impact as it can on the marine environment and the people who catch it. That's me. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was fascinating. And I think it's perfect to start the session to give a overview of the challenges and issues between industrial fishing and small scale fishing. So thank you very much. And we really need more organizations like yours <laughs> to uh, advocate for this sector. Uh, Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Caroline. That was really fascinating. And I found a lot of synergies as well between um, our work. So I, I look forward to um, to discussing, hang on, get my uh, presentation open here for you. Okay, so um, my name is Jennifer Hearn. I am the Social Programs Director with Future of Fish Peru. And today I'm gonna talk to you about Future of Fish as a systems intermediary. We use human and systems-based desi design to address complex problems and find innovative solutions to overfishing. There we go. So, we are an international NGO that works directly with fishers and fishing communities to work towards thriving and resilient coastal communities. We promote innovation that creates equity, economic and environmental value that benefits both people and the environment. Everything we do is based on collaborations at all levels and among all actors. So we collaborate with the state, the community, the private sector and academia and all of our interventions are focused on people as a central point of our methodology and intervention strategy. We're a very diverse team of professionals from marine biologists to business administration, um, international development pro professionals and um, fisheries engineers that constantly question the status quo, allowing us for a constant intersectional analysis in everything that we do. There are a lot of problems facing artisanal fishing. Um, a global power imbalance in supply chains um, perpetuates low payment for fishers, low product quality, a lack of transparency in supply chains and incentivize, incentivizes an informal and illegal economy. Illegal, unreported and unregulated um, uh, fishing is rampant with a lack of incentives and viable solutions and unrealistic barriers for progress in the developing world. There's a lack of access to basic services in fishing communities, especially in Peru. There's a lack of access to basic healthcare and infrastructure that per perpetuates a vic vicious cycle of poverty. Many of these communities have high adolescent um, pregnancies coupled with high dropout rates in schools for youth which creates a growing and unsustainable pressure put on fisheries for livelihoods maintenance. 
there's a lack of investment and innovation in fisheries, which is key to driving solutions in sustainable change for ocean resources management. And all of these issues together compounded provide a lack for a lack of fisheries data that is key to sustainable change in artisanal fisheries. So all of this said, there is no one solution or silver bullet solution to overfishing. So what we do as Future of Fish is um, a systems design and a human-based design. And we design and pilot all of our, our interventions in a participatory and co-designed manner with the beneficiaries on the ground. So as we engage with um, individuals in the fishing communities, fishers themselves, end market buyers, private sector and government, we design and pilot these solutions and adapt them in the process so that when they do fit uh, the need, we're able to replicate and scale them. We create incentives and embed data into everything that we do so that these solutions provided and when they are scaled, they are able to be applied to a sustainable change and upheld by the beneficiaries themselves. Human-based design is grounded in empathy. We engage and innovate with the communities and the fishers on a first-hand basis. We work with the first mile businesses and the workers who rely on the oceans for their select for their livelihoods. While overfishing is an environmental issue, it is driven by human beings. So we know that we are un we would be unable to um, work and provide solutions to overfishing if we weren't working with the fishers themselves. At Future Fish Peru, we have three different programs. Our social programs that focuses on co-design in community at the community level um, that works with communities as a center of collective and equitable action towards this supporting sustainable economic development and solutions for overfishing. Our seafood programs work in innovation that strengthen leadership of artisanal fisheries in the jumbo flying squid and mahi-mahi fleets for export. And we also work in the domestic market in Peru. So a lot of what um, uh, my colleague here was saying is uh, promoting responsible extraction and consumption of domestic market seafood through a participatory process involving all of the actors in the supply chain in Peru. Um, our social programs work in sustainable change. Once again, this is a systems design and human-based design approach. So we work at three different levels, preventative healthcare and environmental awareness, future visioning and co-design, and cultural identity and pride. So we have human beings at the center of all of our initiatives and want to make sure that we are addressing the key issues and the key root problems um, to be able to provide sustainable and lasting solutions. If you see uh, in the middle here at Future Visioning and Co-Design, we identify and empower local leaders and provide them with all of the tools necessary to be able to advocate for themselves at all levels of the system. So in government, at the community level, and in the private sector, and we collectively identify the needs and search for joint solutions and innovations together um, and really put the community and the fishers at the center. We use a top-down and bottom-up collaboration to promote behavioral change and change in all nodes of the supply chain. So this in our domestic market work, we work with fishers at the point of extraction as well as chefs, supermarkets, end markets, and final consumers to be able to promote responsible consumption and knowledge about responsible extraction. We use digital solutions and traceability to be able to embed data and also have an emphasis on uh, cultural identity and pride. So as my colleague was saying as well, um, really collecting who fished it, where it was fished, how it was fished, and then embedding all of this data into a marketing scheme that helps um, helps identify and provide behavioral change in the end market about responsible consumption. Here's a look at the system. Um, if we're working in systems change, we can't just work on one specific piece. 
And we also have to work at root problems. So here's all these different levers that we really have to change and that we're actively working on in all of the different communities that we work with, with fishing communities and people at the center. So you'll see that we have we work in preventative healthcare and cultural identity, environmental respect, trade and access to finance as uh, sustainable businesses, um, fishing businesses, Con comprehensive sexual health education, uh, co-design, government intervention, strategic alliances. There's a lot of work to be done and Future of Fish really bases its, um, its methodology on collaboration. So systems change need, has a need for collaboration and our partnerships help us amplify our impact. So these are uh, kind of a list of our different um, collaborators and alliances here in Peru. The list is extensive. Um, here's some of our biggest champions thus far, as well as some of our funders. Um, and as my other colleague was saying, I think you're um, referencing Cayetano Heredia as one of the universities. We actually work with them as well in, in some of our uh, research initiatives. So we can't do it alone. And this is one of our, our biggest um, factors of future fish. And we encourage others within Peru and globally to, to reach out because we're looking, we're really looking to, to amplify our impact. That's everything. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I encourage the panelists to put your email in the chat if you like audience members to get in touch because that was a really um, important point of no one can do it alone. We're all in this together and collaboration is really important. Um, Brian, you have the floor. Brian, I think you're muted. So there we are. Can you see my screen? Sorry, I was muted. I was so um, <laughs> enthusiastic by what I had heard from Caroline and Jennifer <laughs> that uh, I was speechless <laughs> for a moment. <laughs> so yes. anyway, I'm unmuted now. Okay, so great. That, we can we can see it. Mm -hmm. You can see it. You can hear me. That's great. So just a little bit about life. Uh, Low Impact Fishers of Europe is in fact a uh, membership organisation. It's a platform currently of about thirty different associations of small scale fishers. And what they have in common is that they're all committed to fishing in a low impact manner and to maximize the socioeconomic impact they have in their communities. So during the reform of the last fishing policy in Europe, which Caroline referred to when she was talking about discards, I was involved with bringing some small scale fishers to Brussels to interact with the commission and all the institutions. And one of the first questions they asked me was, who represents us here, Brian? So I said, oh, well, Europesh, you know, the fishing industry. Well, that's big boats, that's trawlers, that's uh, corporations. You know, what about the small guys? Who represents the small guys? So I said, well, <laughs> there's nobody. So um, life was really set up in response to that, these small scale guys coming to uh, Brussels and seeing that there was nobody there giving them a voice in a policy which affected them fundamentally, a policy which is promoting an industrial kind of fishing and actually discriminating against small scale fishing. So one of the main roles of life is to be a voice and to represent and to bring its members to Brussels to support them so that they can make their voices heard but also to support them at the, um, at the grassroots level because uh, small scale fishers have all kinds of economic problems or legal problems. Often they're arrested for um, uh, transgressions of one kind or another, um, get into difficulties. So as well as a lobbying organization, we try and have projects with our members to strengthen their organizational capacity to basically um, ensure that they're working efficiently, but also in selling and marketing their fish. But anyway, we haven't, we've talked about artisanal fishing, we've talked about small scale fishing, but we haven't actually said what it is. So perhaps we just get on the same page. Um, what is small scale fishing? I think probably in Europe, it's quite different to other parts of the world. Um, here it's about 75% of the fishing fleet, 50% of the employment, but only 5% of the catch. 
And Caroline was saying that in worldwide, it's about 50% of the catch. But of course, in Europe, we have quotas, we have um, uh, fishing policies which promote larger scale fishing. So the 5% of the small scale fleet is basically because they're not allowed to catch more. They don't have access to the resources. They don't have access to the quota. Their fishing grounds are invaded by larger boats, which come and take the fish literally out of their nets, out of their, off their hooks and lines. So there's huge competition in European waters to catch the fish, and it's unfair. There's a, a skewed, uh, um, a skewed sea. Um, so here's a quote from a previous uh, commissioner of fisheries who says that small scale fisheries are the backbone of the fleet, the workers and the community. They are the first to feel the pain of collapsing resources. It is therefore important to build the future with them. I mean, that is fantastic as far as I'm concerned. But then you have today the director of fisheries in Europe who says, what we really mean by small scale fishing is fishing from small boats, which is not necessarily sustainable. To make them sustainable, we need a lot of data and controls to make sure they are abiding by the rules. So, you know, what is what is it then that small scale fishing is both both of them can't be right, can they? So there's no single definition. Um, the European Commission uh, uses the criteria of vessel length and fishing gear. So all vessels lower than 12 meters in length using gears, uh, which are non-towed, that's to say they're using pots, they're using hook and line, they're using nets, which are not towed through the water like trawls. Then we have a kind of socioeconomic definition. In France, anybody can be an artisanal fisherman if they're fishing on a boat which is less than 24 meters, which is non-industrialized and the owner is on board. Then you get into the different languages, French, Spanish, Italian, all have different terms, which again adds more confusion. We have artes menores, petit métier, uh, piccolo pesca, um, uh, pesca de bajura. Um, for me, one of the most interesting approaches I've seen to um, defining or uh, at least getting on the same page is the FAO who've adopted a matrix approach. So if you think of a matrix as being uh, a load of criteria along the um, horizontal axis and on the vertical axis, um, different uh, attributes of, of fisheries. So we can have um, uh, the horsepower of the engine, we can have the number of crew, we can have the length of the vessel, we can have the time that the vessel spends at sea. We can have things like uh, whether the uh, enterprise is formally registered, whether the fishermen belong to association. And then along the top, you have the kind of amount. So um, for, very, for, for fishing operations which score very low, i.e. they're small boats, have a very few crew, spend very few days at sea, those will be classified as artisanal. But for the larger boats, which are spending more time at sea, which have bigger engines, which are catching more fish, then they would be classified as more industrial. But it's a very interesting approach, and I would recommend you have a look at that because it really is, I think, the way to go. Um, in life, we look at a whole variety of other attributes. For us, small scale fishing is a seasonal activity. It's very diverse. You use a variety of gear to catch a variety of species depending on the season. We talk about the catch of the day. So it's fresh fish, which is landed daily. It's rooted in a culture of fishing, of seagoing. It has a, a heritage value. The owner uh, is on board, often fishing with family members and a relatively small crew size. And at the end of the day, fishing is a business. If you don't make a profit, uh, you quickly go out of business. So what we're talking about is really small enterprises. We're talking of enterprises which may, if they're part-time fishermen, they probably turn over tens of thousands of euro a year. If they're full of time, then it may be as much as 100,000, maybe some of the more successful companies, 500,000, um, maybe up to a million uh, euro per year in terms of turnover. But really we're talking about the lower end of that, maybe 100,000 euro. So in this context, the whole 
issue of value addition. If the fisherman doesn't make a profit, he goes out of business. He needs to be a price maker because he's competing in a very competitive market where huge quantities of fish are being landed by larger boats. Tons of fish are coming into the market every day, whereas the small scale guy is catching just a few kilos. So he really needs to be able to say to his buyers, my fish is different, which is what Caroline was talking about. And also Jennifer, how you differentiate the product of the small guy in the market when there's huge competition uh, and there is a whole price depressing price depressing factors going on. You've got a huge volume which has to get be got rid of very quickly. So people don't want to pay a lot for their fish. They want to get rid of it. Small scale fishing is highly dependent on, on voluntary labor. Um, a lot of women are involved with keeping the books, with being the representative of the business, um, dealing with officialdom when the men folk are away at, at sea. The earnings are relatively low, two to three times less than they are in the larger scale sector. So in Europe, we're talking about earnings maybe of 20 to 30,000 euro a year for a small scale fisherman, for a larger scale fisherman, 60 to 80,000 uh, euro a year. The trends are not good, I'm afraid. There's declining profitability. Um, the average age of small boats is very old in Europe, 30, 40 years old. There's very little generational renewal, generational change. So just to put that in perspective, um, we have two models of fishing, two economies, two fishing economies, if you like, the larger scale sector, which is roughly 24% of the fleet in Europe, 45% of the workforce, 80% of the catch, uh, several tons of fish per day, two tons, three tons of fish being caught per day. So landings of 15 to 20 tons coming in at any one particular time, turnover hundreds of thousands to millions of euro per year. Whereas you compare that to the smaller scale, it's you know, several kilos a day. It's a very different business model. It's a very different um, uh, way of, of fishing. So I don't know whether you can see the top of the screen. Mine's, uh, um, sorry, I'll go back. Um, one of the big problems, one of the big issues facing all fishing in Europe, fishing is really at a crossroads because we have the blue economy and we talk about blue fear because we don't know really what the blue economy is going to be. But what we do know is that the European Union is putting its money on aquaculture as the next big growth in marine food, uh, tourism, offshore energy production. We're talking about vast increases in offshore energy, which means less space for fishing. We're talking about increasing maritime transport and infrastructure. Um, so all of that is putting pressure on, on fishing, and we don't know quite how much access we're going to have to fishing grounds. Aquaculture is a particular worry. When you look at European aquaculture, you can see that there were relatively steep increases in production up until roughly uh, 2000. But since 2000, European aquaculture has stagnated. We're talking of two main sectors. One is kind of what I would call feedlot aquaculture, kind of intensive salmon farming, intensive trout farming, where you keep the fish in cages, very intensively grown with, uh, in the same way you would grow chickens or intensive beef or intensive uh, animal rearing on land. Very polluting, um, high energy uh, demands, uh, a big uh, ecological footprint, um, questionable labor standards. And we're also talking a, a bit of unknown because the European Commission says that one of the main constraining factors is access to water resources and access to space. So in the coming period, um, there will be more access given to aquaculture compared to fisheries, uh, more money being put in. And on the horizon, we also have blue food. And we're not quite sure what that is. In the um, a recent, uh, um, uh, food summit, uh, UN food summit, uh, we talk the um, uh, marine uh, sector uh, said the next big step forward will be on blue food, 
which could be like uh, what I would call analog fish or single cell protein from the sea or even intensive uh, seaweed farming. And there's some very worrying developments there. Um, I was talking with Caroline earlier about um, the slow food terra madre meeting we were at and very worrying stories coming from Canada or US and Europe about large corporations moving into seaweed farming, introducing new species and uh, taking over areas which are traditional fishing grounds. So one of the main areas where we can change things is in the marketplace. We can stop eating industrially produced fish if we so choose. But we're swimming against the um, we're swimming against the current because our food systems are highly centralized. They're complex, fragile, and just in time. Most of us do our shopping in the supermarkets. Around fifty percent of what we consume comes from five main species: salmon, tuna, cod, prawns, uh, basically white fish fillet, and most of it is in frozen form. So we've got to buck that trend. In Europe also, we're highly dependent on imports. 60 to 70% of what we consume is imported. Only 30 to 40% of what ends up on European consumer plates comes from our own fishing. 25% comes from aquaculture, 10% from the EU aquaculture, but only 1.5% of what we eat comes from EU small-scale fisheries, which is round about 55 grams for every kilo we consume. So fishermen, small scale fishermen in particular, are caught in a kind of vicious circle, which Jennifer um, referred to, where they're kind of stuck in a trap where they can't get the value they need from their product. They can't get access to fishing quotas. Their organizations are weak because they can't get institutional support. It's a struggle to fix fair prices. There's a dominance of a few high species and there's uncertain and unstable prices. And that was particularly so during the, the pandemic. So what do they do? Uh, they're pushed to fish illegally. They're pushed to intensify their fishing effort to catch more. So hoping that by catching more, they can earn more, but by catching more, the unit price of the fish goes down. So they try and sell outside a legal framework. This aggravates the way a resource Overexploitation is hap happening. And at the same time, there's the issue also that Caroline referred to of uh, modern day slavery. There's a lack of generational renewal. So fishing companies are looking to recruit fishermen from outside the European Union, often on these very, very um, dismal contracts. So there's a risk of disappearing. So there's no off the shelf answers, but at least we can work towards some kind of uh, uh, blue justice. So first and foremost is a level playing field between smaller scale and large scale fishing. Small scale fishers also need to have secure access to resources and secure access to fishing grounds. They also need to have access to public money so that they can, uh, their capacity to organize, to sell their fish, to be effective fishermen, they also need money to do that. So we have a slogan, which is all about public money for public good, not individual uh, gain. So we need to change the way that subsidies are given. We want fair market access. So we want direct selling. Most of the fish is currently sold at auction and most of the fish is sold through large uh, distribution outlets. That's a nonsense for small scale fishing. It simply doesn't work. Large scale outlets, simply don't offer the kind of margins that small scale fishers need. They need people like Caroline for direct selling so that they sell direct to the consumer and they can make sufficient margin. And to do that, they need to forge alliances with people like yourselves with the Aquatic Life Institute. Um, small scale fishers really need to forge alliances with people like you so that they can make their voices heard more effectively. Small scale fishing needs to be recognized and rewarded. Currently, the European policy doesn't really recognize the uh, value that small scale fishing can add. 
there's a whole issue of the traditional knowledge that fishers have that could be used to um, input to uh, um, fisheries management. And there's the whole experiential knowledge they have. These guys are going to see every day. They know what's happening on the fishing grounds. This knowledge is simply not being used. We talk about the lack of data, but you know, sit down around the table with scientists, fishermen and scientists together. You know, they can share the, the knowledge they have. It's not a lack of data, it's there. It's just that it's not tapped into. And we need to attract youth above all. We need to make fishing an attractive proposition for uh, young people. Um, they're not going to join a sector which they see as economically um, not viable or difficult, where they have to work all hours. So we have to combine fishing with tourism. Uh, we have to make it uh, more attractive. We have to bring it into the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brian, for that overview of artisanal fisheries in Europe. Um, shocking statistic that only 5% of um, you know, the whole catch comes from artisanal fisheries, even though they have 75% of the fleet. Um, so I, I've learned a lot. Thank you all very much for your presentations. We have um, around seven to 10 minutes left, so I will dive into our questions. Well, as you know, most of our participants are in the animal welfare movement. And I know that, you know, in small scale, scale fishing, um, you didn't really touch on the aspect of animal welfare, but um, it is, you know, um, a theme that I think a lot of us are <laughs> um, dying to ask you basically. So first of all, um, you know, putting aside that we normally work in industrial skill fishing, at least from um, Aquatic Life Institute's perspective, but in looking at animal welfare issues and how we can work with you to improve maybe having stunning before slaughter, et cetera, in small scale fishing and any other traditional methods of caring for the fish after they're caught. Um, can you just shed some light on, on what, what you've seen in your work in terms of animal welfare related um, types of policies or practices on the ground and where you think we can contribute. Shall I start, Christine? Sure. Um, it's, a, such a, it's such an important question, isn't it? And I, and I think it's, 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 such a, it's such a depressing answer. Um, I mean, it's the one area where I think farmed land, ag agriculture champions wild fish, um, because of course there are such massive restrictions around how and where animals can be slaughtered. Um, so it, I, I, I think for 99% of the fish that we purchase, they, 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 they live well and die horrific, horrifically. Um, so they're either suffocated to death or the, the, the injuries from the, the hooks going into their little mouths is, is bad. And if, if you're a, a fish that's unfortunate enough not to have a swim bladder like a dogfish, sometimes they're even alive when they arrive with us. That's how long they can suffer. Um, it's, it's horrible to see. Um, the only initiative I've seen is called Ikejima, which is a Japanese traditional method of uh, spike through the spinal cord. And a few of our fishers do this for the expensive species like uh, bass or red mullet. But bass and red mullet, so bass they're typically getting, um, I'm going to talk in dollars because it's pretty much the same as pounds these days, 15 to 20 pounds, uh, dollars a kilo. So one two kilo fish, you're, you're earning $40 for just this one fish. It makes, it's worth your while to make this flesh as perfect as it can be. And then there is a small premium for having done that. And people tell me, I've not been fortunate enough to know, to, tell, to differentiate myself, but that there is a, a notable difference in the taste. So if you, if you stop a fish quickly from producing these, um, uh, these acids in their body that deteriorates the flesh quickly, then they taste better. So it, they, lovely nature, doesn't it? It rewards us for treating it well. Um, but it's simply not realistic to think that a, a, a herring shoal would be treated in that way. 
Um, and I suppose from, I don't know, I, you, you, you're, you're right, we have to start where we can. So maybe we should say all expensive large fish have to be caught with that method. And I should be insisting on that with my fishermen. I haven't yet. And it's slightly because I feel it will be such a token gesture by comparison to all the other volumes of fish that we kill in such less humane ways. Um, so open to suggestion, audience. Thanks, Caroline. We will be happy to work with you on that in the future. Yeah. Brian, do you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, I absolutely agree with, with Caroline. Uh, there are no uh, simple answers. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think fishermen, small scale fishermen in particular, are realizing that the less the fish suffers, the less the fish is stressed, the better the quality um, it is. And Caroline referred to this Ikejmi technique and a lot of life members are discovering this. But obviously it's for the higher value fish, which they can get a premium on. But this is all part of what we, both Caroline and myself, I think Jennifer touched on it as well. This idea that you can differentiate the product of the small scale fisher in the market to get this value added. So, I mean, it's uh, when you're landing a few kilos a day, it's easier to ensure that your fish is less stressed, but you're, you're not gonna get over that pain that the fish will have by being caught on a hook or the uh, anxiety it's going to have when it's gasping for uh, for oxygen uh, on, on the deck. Um, but uh, like the fishermen we work with in um, in, in Costa Brava, Estatit, uh, uh, just north of Barcelona, they bring the fish to port alive. So they have a kind of vivier tank where they keep the fish in. And once they're in port, then they do this ikejmi. They don't do it on all the fish, but they do it on some fish. And they're, I mean, they're really working with some of the top uh, chefs in this area, just north of Barcelona, who are paying this premium. And yeah, they can afford to do it, you could say. But um, yeah, I mean, I think we gradually have to kind of insist that, you know, you have these animal welfare criteria. You're not gonna catch me all your fish, but you have some animal welfare criteria which are used and even I think the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, maybe the Marine Stewardship Council will come into that, but the animal, uh, the uh, Aquaculture Stewardship Council are considering having animal welfare criteria. And I think that's something we have to develop for, for small scale fishing. Thank you. Thank you for the response. Jennifer, did you wanna chime in? Sure thing. Really interesting question, um, especially in the developing world. And, and I can speak for um, my experience across Latin America in general. Their animal welfare is, isn't generally taken into consideration as a whole because animals are seen um, as utility um, still. There's still a lot of work to be done as far as animal rights. You'll see a lot of street dogs and cats. Um, animal abuse in homes. Um, so there's a long way to go as far as fisheries, um, so to speak. However, if, if we're working in fisheries, um, systems change and we're working in social programs and environmental welfare, they go really hand in hand because it's, a, it's an issue of, of respect and empathy. Empathy for the humans and the socioeconomic well-being of the actors that you're working with then therefore it should be reflected upon you know, the, the fisheries that are providing that livelihood. So um, as, as future of fish uh, Peru, and I would say speak as a whole, we would 100% be interested in, in collaborating with any institute that had an interest in, in working in, um, in any of these practices in the developing world, because um, there is, as both Caroline and Brian were stating, an interest in this value add at the end of um, in marketing practices. So if you can if you can link that directly with animal welfare and um, and do no harm practices, then I think I think it's something that that can definitely be worked on. Thanks for your <laughs> suggestions for collaboration. We would be really interested, um, and I'm sure others in the audience uh, would like to. 
uh, participate somehow in the future too to contribute to improving animal welfare in this sector. So last question is, um, Jennifer, you said something that I really liked is breaking the status quo, which is something we're all trying to do in this nascent aquatic animal welfare movement and getting global leaders, for example, at COP27, where we will be presenting to start talking about animal welfare, protecting the main stakeholders of the oceans as they talk about ocean conservation, sustainable fisheries. So um, I just wanted to ask you, um, Jennifer, or any of the panelists to respond, will you be at COP27 or will this issue be brought up during COP27 or what do you hope to see? Hey, Christine, really interesting question. Um, I think breaking the status quo, as far as my participation or our participation, that's not, not confirmed yet, but um, would love to see more of it. And I think it's breaking the status quo, at least for us, is focusing on the why and not the how. Um, when we focus on how we're going to get things done, it's overwhelming and daunting. There are so many issues and it's often difficult to see where to start um, and how to start. However, if we focus on why we're doing it, and I think that can really be approached from any lens that you set. If you find your personal why and then your institution's why, um, I think then we have a pathway forward and also a path for collaboration, whether that be in country domestically in Peru or around the world. There's so many different initiatives that work in collaborative manners, especially in traceability and data collection, which is key for artisanal fishers. And I see already alignment between Caroline, uh, Brian, and, and myself in, in um, these value adds and cultural identity. And how can we really bring that into um, traceability efforts to make it more of a global movement? So um, I think it's something that would definitely be valuable to, to touch on, um, not necessarily how we're going to do it first, but why we're doing it, and then and then uh, focusing on alignment around all these different initiatives. Great point, Caroline or Brian? Yeah, happy to chip in. I mean, you mentioned COP27, uh, particularly. I mean, the uh, small-scale fishers are active in various international venues. Uh, they come to the, the UN um, meetings at, at FAO, our Committee on Food Security, Committee on Fisheries. I was actually in um, Lisbon for the United Nations Oceans uh, Conference. And there were, of the 6,000 delegates, there were 20 small scale fishers from six continents and they produced a call to action where they set out demands. I mean, small scale fishers are perhaps the largest ocean user uh, out of any of the, um, in terms of people, numbers of people who depend on the oceans for their livelihoods, their food, their way of life, their cultural identity, and so on. And yet they're overlooked in so many of the discussions going on. So yeah, I mean, I think it is important that they go, but part of the problem is that, you know, small scale fishers are busy fishing. Uh, that's what they do. If they don't go out fishing, they don't earn a livelihood. If they're not putting food on the table, where's the food going to come from? Um, being aware of what's being discussed at these big international meetings, uh, it takes a lot of navigating, as, as, as you know. I mean, if you go to one of these big meetings, there's a lot of preparation. You know, who's who, who's on what delegation, who's uh, championing what cause, and so on. There's a lot of homework you need to do. And then there's all the understanding of how these different bits of the international jigsaw puzzle all, all fit together. I mean, it makes a, even for a kind of policy wonk, it makes your head spin. Imagine what it's like for a small scale fisher. But I mean, COP27 is all about carbon. Uh, it's all about climate change. It's all about, you know, how we get down to below, uh, you know, a, a, a rise in, uh, in in atmospheric temperature of, as, as low as possible. Um, and there are different strands to that. There's a whole blue carbon. I mean, I don't want to get into any of these debates, but they become very kind of inaccessible uh, for, you know, fishers to engage in. I mean, blue carbon, what does that mean? You know, 
and uh, you know uh, becoming carbon neutral. I mean, fishing is dependent on fossil fuel, and there are no off-the-shelf uh, um, solutions to you know what you run your engine on apart from diesel or, or petrol. I mean, there are electric outboard engines and so on. So, you know, we need more on solutions uh, rather than debates about uh, uh, how do we get to being carbon neutral when, you know, the, the kind of uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia has highlighted just how dependent we are on fossil fuel and just how little political will there is to change the status quo. So yeah, we need an earthquake. Uh, more and uh, yeah, changing the status quo is, is is not is you know is not a debate. It has to be done, but how you do that, I don't know. It's not easy. Ooh. Well, hacking away at it little by little. Uh, Caroline, any last uh, minute comments? Yeah, sadly, Brian, I think we're probably heading for an earthquake. But there you go. Um, I think, think it, as Brian says, uh, for fishermen to participate at something as global as a COP. Uh, conference is, is very difficult. So we would be advocates behind an organization like LIFE or the equivalent in the UK, which is called NUTFA. Um, so we will be advocating for them to be present and, and putting the case for the small scale fisher there. But I think what happened with the UN where they were saying that um, quota access has to be given to small scale fishers now or did, they didn't say that they said it has to be access uh, given over to environmentally low impact fisheries and socially responsible fisheries so it's essential to 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 bring to these cop meetings that it's actually legislative stuff there that we have to put in place if there's new quota to be given to fisheries it has to be based on low impact um, so it's 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 reinforcing the legislative stuff that's already there that will help us, I think, get the small scale fishers' voice heard. Absolutely, and that'll spur some new technological innovation, hopefully, as well. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much. We um, went over time, so thank you for staying eight minutes extra. Um, as I said, we'll be at COP27, so I think my colleague will share our call to action in the chat and please help amplify this message on social media. Our next session begins in one minute, sorry for going over, and it's on protecting wild animals. So we will see you soon. Thank you all so much. Take care. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Really good mm -hmm. session. Really enjoyed the Thank discussion. You. Thanks a lot, Carol, and Jennifer and Christine. <laughs> Bye for now. Yeah, Bye for now. Nice to catch up. Bye. Yeah, we'll stay in touch. Bye.